Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at the story of Joash, 2 Kings chapters 11 and 12. We've been going through the books of 1 and 2 Kings, seeing the kings of Israel, notice they are listed on the left, and then the kings of Judah in the red on the right. Uh, these are parallel kingdoms, and in the case of Israel, we had seen the third dynasty beginning with Omri, Ahab, Ahaziah, and finally Joram. Um, and that came to an end when Jehu com comes on the scene, kills all the... <laughs> all the family of the third dynasty, and begins now what will be his own family, his own dynasty. Uh, and at the same time, he also puts to death uh, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, and uh, Athaliah, her, uh, Ahaziah's, um, uh, I started to say, his, uh, his wife, but it's not his wife, it's his, actually it's his mother, it's Jehoram's wife, uh, who is also uh, part of that Ahab family. Uh, she is now the queen mother reigning in Judah. Let's look at the family tree as, as we see this. Uh, notice this, it all started where Sidon and Israel had entered into an alliance, and you'd had Jezebel, the, the princess from Sidon, the Phoenician princess, marrying Ahab. And so that meant all of their children were... They were Israelites, but they were also half Phoenician, and they were all worshipers of Baal. Um, and then that had com been compounded when Ath Athaliah married Jehoram to bring an alliance between the houses of Israel and Judah. And so now I have a half Phoenician Baal-worshipping queen uh, that's on the, you know, married to the king of Judah. They had had a child, Ahaziah, and then Ahaziah is going to have a number of children, but the one who's going to be king, we'll see his story, and the one we're looking at today is going to be Joash. Chapter 11, verse 1, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal offspring. Now, notice what's just taken place. Uh, we had Jehu come on the scene, and both Joram was killed. And then Ahaziah, who I've just crossed out, he's killed. And then Athaliah comes and kills all the royal offspring. Uh, these are all either her children or could be some of them her stepchildren because Jehoram might, might have had more than one wife. And, uh, she, you know, so she might have been only one of several wives. But in any case, she murders them all. Now, she misses one. She misses young Joash. Uh, he's going to be taken and hidden. Uh, but she's putting an end to that line. Now think about what that means. If that line comes to an end, that means there will be no descendants of David who are on the kingly line. And if there's no descendants of David on the kingly line, there will be no Messiah. And if there's no Messiah, then we all die and go to hell. So this is a, a, a plot of cosmic proportions. Chapter 11, verse 2, but Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, uh, notice killed all of her sons, but there's, uh, there's a daughter uh, who's still alive, the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons who were being put to death and placed him and his nurse in the bedroom. So they hid him from Athaliah. And he was not put to death. So just like Moses had been spared the wrath of Pharaoh when Pharaoh said, kill all the Hebrew boys. So little uh, Joash is taken. He's also hidden. Notice for three months, he, they managed to hide him. And so Joash is the, is the young Heir to the, the heir to the throne, the only surviving line, hadn't been originally destined to be to be the next king because he had plenty of older brothers, and it's all usually it's all, almost always the oldest one that gets uh, the the inheritance and gets the throne. But now he's going to eventually be the new king, but that's only if he can survive. His grandmother putting all of his brothers and trying to put him to death as well. So here again, we have, I just want you to see the, the family. So grandmother Athaliah is putting all of these to death. 
And verse 3, he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord six years while Athaliah was reigning over the land. So they take him and they hide him in the one place that no one will think to look. They hide him in the temple. And he's going to have a special relationship from now on with the temple. Verse 4, now in the seventh year, this is the seventh year of his hiding, uh, Jehoiada sent and brought the captains of hundreds of Karite, uh, Karites uh, and of the guard and brought them uh, to him in the house of the Lord. Then he made a covenant with them and put them under oath in the house of the Lord and showed them the king's son. Now I want to parallel this with Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 11. Second Chronicles uh, 22 tells the same story. But if we if we were to read this, and we're not going to read the Second Chronicles uh, passage, we're just looking at this one verse. But if we looked at the entire passage, we'd see the same story, but quite a number of elements that are added that are not here in Second Kings 11 and 12. But we do want to note this one. Uh, so Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah. Notice there's a family connection there, both with, with the royal family, which is here. But what was not pointed out was that this Jehoiada, the priest, is also has also married into that family because his wife is, uh, is, the, is the same Jacobed that we just read about uh, who hid uh, young Joash. And so Jehoiada, the priest, is he is the uncle by marriage? You know, I'm not sure how, how you call that, but uh, sort of married into the family. He's both priest and yet uncle to the young crown prince, and so he calls in these Karaites uh, and the guard and makes a covenant with them and puts them under oath in the house of the Lord, and then shows them the king's son, the surviving prince. And so this is Jehoiada, and Joash is now brought out, and uh, of course we had Jehoiada, who is the the uh, husband to Jehoshaba, um, and uh, so she's she's the one who initially hid him, and her husband is in on it, and so he's going to act as the spiritual leader for the nation. Verse 12, then he brought the king's son out and put the crown on him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, long live the king. And he is going to live a good many years. Verse 13, now our problem is that there's still Athaliah and she's still the, the queen mother and the queen mother who's been reigning for the last seven years in the absence of any king. When Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people in the house of the Lord. She looked, and behold, the king, this young king, he's only seven years old, but was standing by the pillar according to the custom with the captains and the trumpeters beside the king. And all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets. Well, everyone rejoiced except Athaliah. Athaliah tore her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! Actually, what she had done was an act of treason. But the treasonous will always accuse others of their crime. Have you ever noticed that sinners, somebody who's caught in a particular sin, will also always want to accuse others of that same sin, even if the others haven't been guilty? And that's oftentimes a reason uh, or a method to try to cover up. Verse 15, then Jehoiada the priest commanded the captains of hundreds who were appointed over the army and said to them, bring her out between the ranks and whoever follows her put to death with the sword. For the priest said, let her not be put to death in the house of the Lord. So they're going to take her out. And they seized her. And when she arrived at the horse's entrance to the king's house, she was put to death there. And so that's the end of this, of this plot to overthrow all the kings of Judah. Verse 17, the Jehoiada made a covenant between the Lord and the king and the people that they would be the Lord's people, also between the king and the people. So this covenant, notice who enters into it. Uh, Jehoiada is the one cutting the covenant, uh, and it involves the king and the people and how they are going to belong to the Lord. 
Now, when it says that he made a covenant, Yakarat Hayoida et Ha Barit, this is uh, Yehoida. Literally, he cut a covenant. Remember, you always cut a covenant. You always, what you would do is you take an animal and you would kill it, and then you would cut on it. You would actually cut the animal in two. And what you were saying is, if I don't keep my part in this covenant, may what happened to that animal happen in the future to me. So it's a covenant, not just a promise. A covenant is a relationship where you're binding yourself with an oath, actually with a curse, where you're saying, may I be cursed if I don't keep my part in this covenant. And the king and the people bound themselves to the Lord. Verse 18, all the people of the land went to the house of Baal. Now notice there was a house of Baal in the land of Judah. You, th- you thought, well, that was only up in the territory of the Phoenicians. Or, or yes, I know that uh, the, the northern kingdom of Israel had places of Baal and worshippers of Baal for a time, especially after Jezebel had, had become queen. But this had now infiltrated into the land of Judah. And they went to the house of Baal and tore it down. His altars and his images, they broke in pieces thoroughly and killed Matan, the priest of Baal, before the altars. And the priests appointed officers over the house of the Lord. And so instead of worshiping at at this pagan temple of Baal, from now on, the people are going to worship at the house of the Lord. Now we come to chapter 12. Verse 1, it's the rest of the story. In the seventh year of Jehu, Jehoash, and you say, Jehoash, wait a minute, who's that? I thought his name was Joash. It's the same person, two different pronunciations of his name, two different spellings. So you have Joash and Jehoash, and it's the same person. So don't let that throw you. Jehoash became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. And so, remember, Joash and Jehoash, they are the same person. Two different names, uh, two different variations, I should say. It's really the same name even, but two different variations on the same name. And so, now we have Jehoash, and he's going to reign uh, from 835, and I'm using Thiel's dates here, um, you know, so close enough for government work, give or take a couple of years, from 835 to 796 B.C. Verse 2, Jehoash did right in the sight of the Lord all his days in which Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. Only the, now here's the problem, here's the exception, only the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. That is, instead of using the temple exclusively, they were using the temple, but instead of that being the exclusive worship, the place of worship, there were other high places throughout the land of Judah, where they were still sacrificing, where they were still burning incense, uh, presumably not to pagan gods anymore, only to the Lord, but not doing it in the place, or not doing it only in the place where he had said. And so that's that speaks of a problem. And yet, and yet that doesn't take away from the fact, notice again verse 2, he did right in sight of the Lord all his days, well, not all his days, but all in his days in which Jehoiada the priest instructed him, as long as Jehoiada the priest was there. And Jehoiada the priest was there for quite a number of years. But eventually Jehoiada the priest would die. And then we would see a change. Now, now 2 Kings 12 isn't going to talk about that change. We're not going to, to go there. To learn about that, you have to go read 2 Chronicles and get the 2 Chronicles version of the story of Jehoash, and then it tells the negative side of that story. But we're not going to focus on the negative side because because 2 Kings does not. And so we're going to take our cue from the writer of 2 Kings. And so he continues, verse 4, Then Jehoash said to the priests, All the money of the sacred things, which is in which is brought into the house of the Lord, in current money, both the money of each man's assessment and all the money which any man's heart prompts him to bring into the house of the Lord, let all the priests take it for themselves, each from his acquaintance, and they shall repair the damages of the house wherever any damage may be found. Now, when it talks about money, we probably ought to make a little footnote uh, that they don't have dollar bills. They don't necessarily even have coins. This, just the term, uh, just describes silver. 
Um, and so uh, silver would probably ap apply if they had gold or any other valuable commodity. Uh, it, whatever they have, they're going to be using that um, to to um, to both supply to the needs of the of the priests, but also to supply the the reconstruction of any damages. After all, the temple's an old building by now. It's the temple's been there for several hundred years. And it's getting old, and every once in a while it needs to be fixed up. And so uh, the money is to go, at least in part, both for ministry, but also for construction um, and upkeep of the temple. And of course, remember, Jehoash should spend his first seven years there in the temple. Uh, uh, so he's well aware of the temple and what might need to be repaired there. Verse 6, but it came about that in the 23rd year of King Jehoash, the priest had not repaired the damages of the house. Even though he had given the instruction, um, there was some royal procrastination here, not on his part, but upon the priest's part. Um, and it just hadn't been going like it should. Verse 7, then King Jehoash called for Jehoiada, the priest, and for the other priests and said to them, why do you not repair the damages of the house? Now, therefore, take no more money from your acquaintances, but pay for uh, pay it for the damages of the house. Uh, you've been collecting money and you've been spending it on yourself. I don't know that that uh, Jehoi uh, Jehoiada has been doing that, but other priests, I'm assuming, have been doing this. And you've been spending, you've been hoarding it, you've been spending it on yourself and not allowing part of that to go for the repairs on the house of God, on the temple. And so he institutes some reforms. The money is taken out of the hands of the priesthood. That's been part of the problem. The priests have been collecting money and um, no, there's been no oversight. And so a system of financial accountability now is instituted and the construction crews are paid out of these funds so that the temple can be restored. And the work is going to continue until the temple is restored. Money from the guilt and the sin offerings continue to go to the priests, but other monies that are given now go to this construction fund. Now, it's interesting that a, a inscription is known as the Jehoash inscription, but he's not named in the inscription. Uh, it's, it's implied. This uh, came to light. I don't want to say it was discovered because it, it came to light under um, sort of suspicious circumstances. It was reportedly discovered at an illegal excavation of the Temple Mount where, where um, Muslim authorities were just digging out uh, parts of earth. They were, they were just digging, not for archaeological purposes, but just to do some construction there uh, on the south end of the Temple Mount where they have a mosque. And uh, they'd brought in bulldozers and labor crews, and they, they dug out all of uh, this earth and just sort of threw it into a big garbage heap. And supposedly, this tablet was found in that garbage heap. And so uh, you can't really call it an archaeological relic because it wasn't really discovered in an archaeological dig. And, but it was discovered, but its authenticity was also questioned. And so we're not sure what to make of it. it if, it's, if it's authentic, and that's frankly still in my mind a, a, a question mark. I don't want to say that it is. I don't want to say that it isn't. Um, but the Jehoash inscription uh, speaks to this issue of, of monies being used to reconstruct the temple. Like I said, Jehoash is not mentioned by name in the inscription. And you can see the, the old Hebrew text. Back to our scriptures, the next thing that happens, 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 17, then Hazael, and we looked at Hazael in the last chapter and how he had become the king of Aram through assassination. Uh, and Hazael, king of Aram, went up and fought against Gath and captured it. Gath was a Philistine city uh, down along the coast. And he captured it, and from there he set his face to go up to Jerusalem. So uh, he had captured Gath, but his plans were now to come up against Jerusalem and to seek to capture Jerusalem as well. 
Verse 18, Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the sacred things that Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, these are his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather, kings of Judah had dedicated, and his own sacred things, and all the gold that was found among the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the king's house. He gathered all the money that he could find, whether it was temple money or his own money, and sent it all on a big, giant bribe to Hazael, king of Aram to try to get him to say, look, we'll, you know, don't come here and try to, to capture our city and despoil it. We'll just take all the money and give it to you. We'll, we'll give you our wallet. We'll give you our checkbook. We'll give you our credit card and just go away. And, and it worked, sort of. He, he went away from Jerusalem and uh, they bought him off. They, they despoiled, they robbed their own city in order to pay him off. Um, and notice how there's not any commentary to say, Was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? Was that just a thing? Um, It sort of leaves it up to the reader to decide. But the situation was not good. And I'm not entirely sure that the solution was good either. Notice he robs the temple and himself. But we don't see him turning to the Lord and saying, Lord, can you do something? Instead of trusting in God, he trusts in the money. And I find that just a little sad. And so here again, Jehoash uh, robbing the temple, I shouldn't say that, uh, but taking the money from the temple and sending it off for this giant bribe uh, to the king of Aram. Verse 19, now the rest of the acts of Joash, and remember he's called Joash sometimes, or Jehoash, same person, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? A little footnote, uh, remember to read up in the Chronicles to see the rest of the story. We'll do that at some future date. And so Jehoash, he's coming to an end here. Verse 20, his servants arose, and here's the end, and it's a very dishonorable end. His servants arose and made a conspiracy and struck down Joash at the house of Milo as he was going down to Selah. For Jazakar, the son of Shimeath, and Jehazabed, the son of Shomer, his servants, struck him, and he died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Amaziah, his son, became king in his place. It's it's not a happy ending. Notice it wasn't a happy beginning with, uh, with all of his, his older brothers being, being slaughtered. And then he is murdered at the end. And so we conclude with the story of Jehoash and his son Amaziah uh, now comes on the scene and, he, and will be another son who, who reigns for a long time. But some lessons now from the life of Jehoash. Uh, First of all, notice how God keeps a remnant. I mean, we were down to one life, one little boy. And if he died, all the promises of God regarding a king and a Messiah and one who would be on the throne of David would be overturned. And yet God preserved within a single life his, his remnant and God still preserves a remnant even today. Today, a spiritual remnant, a remnant that no matter how bad things get, he preserves his people. And we have become a part of that remnant as we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, notice the the value of a spiritual mentor, that as long as, as this priest was there to guide him, we have young Joash doing a good job, um, even bringing reform to the temple, and that's a positive thing. Now, like, like I said, when we go to Second Chronicles, we see the negative side of the story, but we're not going to go there right now. But there's a value in having an older spiritual mentor, although the best is when that mentor can grow up that person, that disciple, that one he, that whom he is mentoring so that when the mentor is no longer there, the lessons will continue to be followed. Thirdly, the lesson of financial accountability in ministry. 
where we saw the example of the priests. Some of the priests were not being financially accountable, and so a new system was needed to set up to push and to mandate this financial accountability. And I think financial accountability in ministry is a good thing, a necessary thing. And it's good that we have people that can hold spiritual leaders financially accountable. Finally, notice how good beginnings, and, and even though the story started with a murder, but then when, when uh, young Joash is brought up to the throne, that's a good beginning. And he has this mentor that's holding him in place. And that's a good beginning. And we have the putting aside of, of Baal and that pagan worship. And that's a good beginning. But even good beginnings can sometimes lead to bad endings if the lessons are not learned long term. And so it's a warning to us that have we, have we made a good beginning? Have you come to that place of faith and repentance and turning toward Christ? That's that's good. That's a good beginning. But that needs to be an ongoing repentance. That faith needs to be a continuing faith that continues to grow and to follow the Lord all the days of our lives so that our ending can be as good as our beginning.